Hi there and welcome to this video. We're going to cover a requested question from Wysant and this is looking at a statistics problem in the realm of hypothesis testing. Now in this problem that we're handed we actually have two different questions but the one that you see that's bolded is the one I'm going to cover and actually do um, detailed practice on you know for you to follow along and understand and how to set up and solve the problem. Um, the first one I did just show here, just so we can make a few comments about it. And so when you read through the problem again, you see that you're provided, in a, in a way I like to say is the topic sentence, right? A manufacturer is claiming more than 85% of the tires will last at least 80,000 kilometers. And then what follows up is information about a sample, right? So where did that sample come from? It had to come from the population and this is usually stated in the first sentence, again, the topic sentence. So just apply, you know, your reading, writing skills to knowing how to break down, you know, a word problem, especially in math. Uh, I would say math and science. So in that second sentence, they're talking about the sample. There's 400 tires and 22 out of the 400 are reaching, uh, are worn out before reaching 80,000 kilometers. And so that is, you know, your sample proportion compared to the population proportion that's given in the first sentence. So I'm going to leave that to you. I, I'll just say to understand how to set it up, it's important to know what is the parameter. And from that point, then what type of distribution do you have? And now more importantly, given the two questions here, whether you're dealing with one sample or two of them. OK, so this first question, number one, that is a one sample test. This second one that we're going to go through together is two sample. And it's pretty it's a pretty, you know, hefty, massive paragraph here. Um, I've seen some larger than this, but this is a good amount. And this is why I wanted to focus on it, because it's it's that one that has a lot of words. And I'm going to guide you through how do you break this down and set things up in the right way. So first it says, as many customers are choosing to do their Christmas shopping online, retailers are advertising their competitive delivery time. So the topic, the focus of the studies we're going to be uh, introduced to has to do with delivery times for consumer products. And this is specifically for Christmas, right? So right on time. Now, suppose you want to advertise your business as offering the fastest delivery time. All right, so you are in the shoes of, you know, a research project. You know, you're not necessarily a researcher, but maybe, you know, you are, I would say, um, even though your main thing is business. So you, you're a business owner. You want to you want to show that you have the fastest time, but you're going to first take a sample to prove this. So you're going to sample 100 delivery packages. OK, the wording, I'm not sure if this came straight from the text. But, um, you know, it's trying to say that you take a, a random sample of 100 uh, packages being delivered. The amount of time is recorded for every single delivery. You're right. So you're going to see how long it takes for each delivery to make it. And then once you once you, the researcher in this case, had found every observation of each delivery, you found the average of that sample, which is seven hours and 15 minutes. And you also found the standard deviation of that sample, which is two hours and 30 minutes. Um, just a side note real quick. Um, you can, again, use your writing and reading skills here and use context clues to understand, given the standard deviation, whether it's a population or a sample standard deviation. And this is really important because this also plays into what type of distribution do you have? And that's going to get you know, be the point in a little bit, but we're going to finish reading this first and then go back through the notes. So um, then you have your competitor who samples 80 of their delivery times, and they found that their average turned out to be at eight hours and 45 minutes with a standard deviation of three hours. So as this is your competitor, you're going to show against your competitor that you have the fastest time. And we all know that fast time or maybe let's say delivery. Fast delivery means 
shorter time. So let's just be clear about that to ourselves because we're looking at the numbers and we need to understand, you know, which one is going to fit the bill. And that's ultimately the question here. I'm going to use a different color to highlight this. So yeah, the question is, is there sufficient evidence? So this is the hypothesis test question to support your advertisement. Remember, your advertisement is claiming you have a faster time than, say, your leading competitor. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I had a bit of trouble in the beginning when I read this the first time. Like, you know, what type of situation? What is the sort of setup that we're going to do? And this is what I mentioned in the beginning, right? It's that, you know, whether you have a one sample versus two sample and based on that, how exactly are things going to look with your hypotheses? And again, we're going to be testing it with a level significance of 10%. So just to highlight that part. Okay, so number of things to take away from this before we actually get into, you know, solving the problem using whatever technology, whatever formulas we're going to do, whatever process you want to go through. The first thing we need to identify is again, and let me use, yeah, let me use a green color. No, let me use blue. We need to identify the parameter in this problem. So I'm just gonna write it up top here. This is important because as you learned up to this point, you'll see that there's actually, you know, three different parameters. Um, I think I have it in these, nope, not those notes. So let me just pull up. Yeah, that's the one that I want. Okay. So this flow chart I um, just created for, for statistics students a while back, like a few years ago, because I thought, hey, let's put a simplistic flow um, together, summarizing parameter and then distribution. So this would be great for notes. But what I added to this diagram is to the upper right, Two things to note to yourself for every problem that you come across. What's the parameter? And then what's the distribution from that? Let me not jump ahead yet. So before then, before I move forward, just note that um, pretty much every time for a proportion, you're going to use a z-test or z-distribution. For a variance, you're going to use chi-square. For the mean, though, you have two different options, two different paths. And it's really it really all comes down to whether you have sigma or you don't. There's other uh, detailed characteristics behind these two distributions, why you would go with one versus another. But like the main thing really is, do you have sigma or do you not have sigma? So if we don't have sigma, then you have an S value, that st sample standard deviation. You're also going to use degrees of freedom for a T distribution. That's the situation that we're in. We have a we're given standard deviations of two samples we're not told anything about the population standard deviation or variance that's going to be another thing to note in a little bit so therefore we're going to use the t distribution for the mean so the parameter is the mean and the distribution is t so again because we don't have the the sigma value we are using the s value OK, now when it comes to figuring out, you know, what way you want to do this, it's really up to you. Um, I would I would actually lean on using technology more because uh, if you have a test quizzes that you're working on and you don't feel like you you have enough time to work through every question, especially if a lot of the questions are heavy like this, then it's really good to use the technology to save time. That's really the best thing. You know, you can totally do all this by hand. I'm not gonna do that for the, you know, for the purpose of time in this video. So just know that you can, you can definitely do that. And I am showing the formulas for it, but um, <laughs> I will definitely be using technology, okay? So the test for the mean uh, for a T distribution or a T test, okay? You're gonna take the difference between the two sample means and subtract it or subtract from that really zero, okay? Because as you'll see in a moment when we talk about 
you know, in the process of hypothesis testing, the null hypothesis, um, the null is always representing no difference, no effect. And when it comes to two sample testing, this means that the population parameters, this in this case, the population means, they are equal to each other. So if you were to re rewrite that little equation, which is, you know, mu equals mu, all right, mu one equals mu two, rewrite it where one is moved to one to the other side. That means that they will subtract from each other resulting in zero. Okay, so you can look at the formula like this, the one in the front, or you can look at the one like this towards the other end of it. Both are pretty much the same thing. Okay, and so when you're using the t-test, you have absolutely need to know something about the degrees of freedom. There's actually two types. Now, the first one you probably learn immediately. Um, I don't know if they use this phrase, but I found this out using a particular calculator that I'm going to show in this video, which is called conservative estimate. This is where you're finding the degrees of freedom simply as n minus 1 for each sample. So there you can see n of the first sample minus 1, n of the second sample minus 2. And if they're not the same degrees of freedom, meaning they're not the same sample, you're going to go with the smaller degrees of freedom. And my understanding of that, I would say the reason behind it is when you're using degrees of freedom, it's directly, directly connected or correctly based in the sample, as you can see with the formula. And so you don't want to you don't want to have the degrees of freedom larger than any of the two sample sizes. OK, um, if I can recall correctly, the definition of it is that it's representing the amount of freedom that individual values in the sample can vary. OK, so please just research that further if you want or, you know, verify that definition. You should have that somewhere in your learning materials or just look it up online somewhere. <laughs> OK, but that conservative estimate that's probably really good to use when you're finding like the critical value, if you're going to use the critical value, which is called the classical or traditional method. However, when it comes to the test, it may not always be used. And that's why we have another one. OK, um, the short name of this type of t-test statistic degrees of freedom is Welch. Um, there's another name to it I will show on, um, in a particular calculator that I'll feature in this video. But this one is actually based on whether you know if the population variances are the same or if you don't know or just assume that they're not because you don't have any uh, information to verify that. And this is relating to the concept of pooling your information. Okay, pooling simply is, and you can tell by the name, right? Pooling is talking about bringing together uh, the values of the two samples in terms of either S, oh, sorry, I know exactly what I was going to say now. In terms of averaging the variance, um, you know, for the two to make it look like they have the same variance because they would have the same population variance anyway. Okay, so you, when you pull the data like that, it'll lead to a particular type of um, the. Mm, I guess the degrees of freedom would be affected. And then this would have an effect for sure on the p-value if you're using the p-value method. But if you do not pull, which is often the case because especially when we have uh, two sample means where we don't know anything about the population standard deviation, therefore we don't know anything about the population variance, this means that we are going to use, uh, we're going to follow that path of not pulling. And in that path, we're gonna use this Welch degrees of freedom, Welch's degrees of freedom, or Welch's test statistic. Now, this is the formula. You are more than welcome to do that, but this is why technology is pretty great at this point. Okay, we use technology mostly when we get to confidence intervals, hypothesis testing, because there's a whole lot of factors, there's a whole lot of you know, detailed, nuanced things to, to, to calculate or compute and tedious stuff too. I mean, it's just a lot of work, <laughs> you know, let's just, let's just give the calculator that to do. 
And this can go um, through calculator, certain calculators like TI calculators are probably the most popular one. There's also Casio calculators. There may be some other graphing or scientific ones. But you can use the 36, the 83, the 84, the Inspire, something like that if you're dealing with handheld calculators. Excel is also able to, um, you know, take care of these sort of computations. RStudio, GMP, if you're dealing with SPSS, that's like the fancy high-level um, statistical software because you're dealing more with, you're, you're dealing with a lot of coding. And then the other calculator that, or this other calculator I'm featuring in this video is a website titled Subedi or rsubedi. That's the URL right here, rsubedi.com, which I actually um, learned about this through a student of mine that I worked with. Um, her professor supplied this website for his class. So I thought, hey, this is pretty great. So I'm gonna share that with you all in solving this problem. Okay, so without further ado, hopefully I've touched on as much review as possible in relation to this question. We're gonna now get into dealing with the material, the information we're provided to solve the problem. So again, we're told that you are comparing, you are basically testing your sample, but this is going up against your competitors sampling. Notice you have more, um, subjects in your sample, by the way. So that's going to probably lean in your favor as well. But nonetheless, you are claiming that you have a faster delivery, say, compared to your leading competitor here. And so we actually see that when you, um, after you had hypothetically calculated and calculated the averages and all of that stuff, the different measures, your mean does come out to be less than your competitor. The first thing I did before I started plugging stuff into formulas or calculators is I actually turned the information they provided us into one value. Because notice we have in time two units, hours and minutes. Even though they're relating to the same concept, we need something a little bit more feasible to work with. So you have to choose. Either you deal in hours solely or you just deal in minutes. So I went with hours because it was a little bit easier, probably, you know, less, it looks like smaller numbers, <laughs> okay, um, when you turn it into hours. So I just turned 15 minutes into 0 .20, 0 0.15, for example. Sorry, 0 0.25 is the, is the value. Okay. And I'm glad I checked that and fixed it. All right. So we are testing at the level... 0.10 for the significance. And we're going to start, of course, with our hypotheses. And the null again is always saying, oh, there's, there's nothing different between these two samples or populations. Whereas you're saying, no, yes, there is, absolutely. We're, we're actually trying to prove and show that my time is less than the other person's, you know, in their company. And so we're going to also just say here we're claiming the alternative because you're basically in the shoes of the researcher at this point. And the null is just being used to support whatever the result that makes sense, right? Um, to, to be the um, counter to your hypothesis. That's all that means, right? So maybe when we talk about the null hypothesis, this could be said about your competitor. Maybe your competitor's like, no, no, we're actually the same. Or maybe I'm, you know, I have less time. So that's what the null is representing in this situation. But you're saying, no, we're not the same time. I'm actually faster than this other company. Now, at this point, we're definitely going to just do the testing and I'm going to use my technology. But remember, you have these two uh, paths or methods that you can do. You also have a third method involving the confidence interval. But we're not going to do that this time. I figure it's either the critical value method you're using or the p-value method. And p-value method is probably still pretty common to use. So I will show both, starting with our curve to the right here. When we're using the uh, critical value method, we actually need to know where our critical what our critical value is. And that involves then either with technology or this 
t-chart here you can just find it real quick so this is what mine looks like and yours probably has the same situation at the top we have our alpha levels confidence intervals maybe and into the far left column we have the list of degrees of freedom and it starts to skip more by more than one when it gets to around 30. Um, so it's, it's kind of yeah <laughs> it's a little annoying but um maybe just to make sure keep it keep the page short so our degrees of freedom if we're using the conservative estimate to find the critical value the degrees of freedom would be the smaller one which in this case is 79 from the second sample having a sample size of 80. and the way we would apply this to the chart is we usually would fall onto the value below the degrees of freedom again so we don't go over any of the sample sizes okay if we went with 80 you pretty much are saying the degrees of freedom is, is the same as the sample the sample size and that's not how it works right so we're going to use 75 and then we just have to find our alpha level what's really great about this chart is it sh it, it just kind of helps you out by splitting it up into you know either it's one tail or two tail let me just go back here real quick and say this is definitely one tailed to the left specifically so the in this left tail test we're going to apply it like that and now we're just going to see where they cross so in that column for an alpha of 0.1 we get the the, the critical value from the t distribution 1.293 again you can definitely do this in like a calculator or i don't know find something online <laughs> right and so on your chart it'll look something like this okay and i meant to write this as equal so of course we have our mean at the middle representing halfway we're going to have our critical value somewhere on here and uh, we actually need to make it negative because it's to the left. Uh, let's put it, let's put it here. And I'm already kind of showing what our critical, or excuse me, what our test value is just by the <laughs> positioning, you know, of this, of the, um, the, the alternative hypothesis. All right, so it's kind of, it's kind of showing ahead what we're gonna see in a moment. But now let's look at, you know, what is our test value? I'm gonna start with the TI-84, and I just took images of me going through each step in the calculator just to refresh or maybe show you for the first time, how do you do this in something like the 84? In the 83, you can do the same thing. It may just be slightly different, a slightly different way of like putting it in the calculator or pulling it up. I know some things are a little bit different, so just to point that out. And I highly recommend, let's say if you have an 83 instead of an 84, just you know, look up videos or just search online, maybe a website or a guide on how to utilize the 83 for statistics. Maybe even talk to someone like a tutor at your school um, on how to do that. So you can see we start with clicking on the button stats. And this takes us to this menu, edit, calc, test. We're going to go over all the way to the right for tests. That's where you can do your hypothesis testing and even find um, confidence interval for estimating, you know, a particular parameter. And right here is where we're going to choose the type of test we need to sample T test, right? We had talked about earlier, we needed to use the T test. When you get into this part of it, then you have to show or choose the type of way you're gonna input the information to actually do the test. And data is where you have raw data. Like if you're given a, a table of all the values, you know, you would have to find the mean and all of that. You would just need to input those values first. Let me go back a little bit. You would just do that first in the edit under edit. Okay, and then choose the label for that for that data set. In this case, though, we're given statistics summary data. So we're going to have that as our input. And there you can see me putting in X bar one, the sample size, excuse me, the, 
standard deviation for the first sample, then sample size, and then everything for the second sample. When you tab down through this list, you're going to finish it off with choosing, you know, what's the test that we're dealing with? And so we have mu1, and then we're going to show how does mu2, um, you know, go up against it. In this case, we're saying that mu1 is going to be less than mu2. Finally, we're going to go with no pooling. Again, the reason why is because we're not told about sigma or the population variance sigma squared, and therefore we can only assume the best, usually the best way to go with this is to assume that we do not have the same variances, population variances between the two samples. So we're going to do that. And remember, because we're assuming that's the case, we're going to get a degrees of freedom through the Welch. And then there's another name I can't remember. <laughs> but that particular, um, that particular calculation. So when we calculate, this is what comes up. Everything you need to know pretty much to make your decision in the end. We have our T test stat, okay, for this particular test, which shows at the top. We have our p-value, and it's pretty small, which is really good in the favor of you, the researcher. And then look at our degrees of freedom. That is not the one that we use to find our, you know, critical value. What you could use to also find the test statistic. Because again, we're, we're having to go with the Welch um, T stat. Let me actually go to a textbook that is confirming this. Okay. So this book is Michael Sullivan, um, I guess the third, but his book on statistics, informed decisions. And in this paragraph, page 553, so if you want to get this book, go for it. It's pretty great. You know, but he in here is, is explaining what is pooled, right? What is a pool T stat and why would we do this versus not pooling? But I like this caution box. This pretty much tells it all. We use it when the two samples, so this means why we pool, when the two samples come from populations that have the same variance, <clears throat> and pooling means we're finding the weighted average of the two sample variances. It's difficult, though, to verify that two population variances might be equal. And so because we're going to assume, because we don't have information to verify that they are the same, we're going to go with the Welch's T. Okay, so that's why we get this degrees of freedom, 153.38, and it's like really long. Remember that, I'm just going to go back so you can see, so you understand. That's the formula that the calculator did for you to produce that degrees of freedom and to find that p-value. Again, the p-value is also using the degrees of freedom. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> so this is what we get. And, you know, I nearly forgot to draw this, but this is the area representing the test, right? Left tail representing an area of the, of the alpha level area 0.10, 10%. All right. So given what we see here in this calculator, we have a t-stat of negative 3.58, let's say 586. And that's what we're going to use to finish off here and answer our question, okay? We were given the p-value, and it showed 2 point something something to the 10, uh, times 10 to the negative 4. So that's 0. 0.0002, okay? Now, before we make our decision all of that, I do want to just share with you again, you know, the, the website and actually show you. When you click rsubedi.com, it's pretty simple and, and user-friendly, I would say. Um, and I would just go to like the tab here and look for hypothesis tests for this problem. And once you get to that point, that page is going to show the three parameters, mean, chi-square for variance, and then proportion. So in the inference for the mean page, we're going to choose sample stats, two samples, we're going to leave it independent because think about it. You are independent in the scenario. You are independent from the competitor. Y'all are not depending on each other. You know, you can make that argument, I guess. <laughs> but no, technically you're not, and you're, you're not depending on them. 
We're choosing test, ta uh, test stat, and then we're going to choose or leave not pulled again because for the reasons we talked about. Notice it's already pulled up Welch Satterthwaite. I'm not sure how exactly to say that, but you see it. That's the Welch T, okay? But in this website, you can actually choose conservative estimate. So I'm going to show you what that looks like in a moment. We're just going to run through this. Now, this part, just be, you know, really mindful of the symbols because unlike the calculator, it doesn't show like mu1 and mu2. But always remember, mu1 is going to be written to the left and mu2 is written to the right. So that's why I chose this first box. This is saying less than. Specifically, mu1 is less than mu2. That's how that lays out. At this point, we just type in the information, just like you would in the calculator. And then we have that 2.5, okay, and three. So just making sure we're lining up everything. This is first column here. This is all sample one, second column, sample two. Then we calculate. So there it is right there, clear as day. Same thing that we saw in the TI-84 uh, TI there in the pictures. Test that, negative 3.5856, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> P-value is written out in standard number form. And you see 0 0.0002, and then degrees of freedom is 153.38. Now watch what happens when we turn it into a conserved investment. Remember, our degrees of freedom, the smaller degrees of freedom, is 79, right? We're not going to go with 99, where the sample for the first is 100. We're going to always go with the smaller degrees of freedom. So by changing it to the conservative, you see the degrees of freedom is 79. But notice something different. The p-value, it's not the same. If you paid attention to the other numbers after the 2, there was another 2. I can even just confirm here. Okay. 2.2566. Okay, here it's now slightly different but pretty much the same sort of number, okay? Although if we round by where the two is, it will go up to three. So it would be significantly different. So I would say this is significantly different when um, we use the degrees of freedom of the conservative estimate, okay? So just be very aware of that, especially if your class is, you know, really pointing that out. Now, coming back to here you know because we have everything now we can make our decision and summarize the results that's usually the last thing okay so just remember that here we have the p-value so if we're using the p-value method if the p-value is less than or equal to alpha we will reject the null if it's greater than alpha we're going to do the opposite we're going to, we're going to not reject it Okay, plain and simple. Same sort of thing with the critical value. Okay, um, the way that we talk about that, though, is of the critical value method, if the test falls within the critical region, which is formed by the critical value boundary, in this case, negative 1.29, if it falls within that region, which it does, <laughs> let me just write that in, so that's 3.586. There it is. We're going to reject it. Okay. The critical region is also called the rejection region, right? So that is what we're going to see here. And again, if you're, if you're using, I was going to say base it, but if you're going to use the critical value method, that's what you would do. That's how you would look at that. So if it's outside, let me just say out. <laughs> outside the critical region, we're gonna do the opposite. So you absolutely guessed it, we are rejecting the null given what we see here. Cause the p-value, sorry about the jumping there. I don't know why I did that. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I did that twice. Hopefully it doesn't do that again. But yeah, given that the p-value is really, really, I keep saying no. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> given that the p-value is really small, 
you know, it's it's also representing itself as within the critical region. So we are absolutely rejecting the null, and we can then say that there is sufficient evidence to claim what you in the scenario claimed that your time is faster than the leading uh, competitor. Okay, and that's how you work it out and set it up to solve this type of problem number two. And I am, I appreciate you, you know, staying throughout this video if you did and really working through it with me. Um, this is, this is tremendous because honestly it does take a lot of work. So I really commend you on that. And I, I hope that um, this was clear and, you know, it brings confidence to you that you know how to do this. Um, and you're able to, to work this out in just about any type of problem. But definitely let us know if you have any questions and we'd be happy to help you with those. See you around.